All right, everyone. I know there are still some folks outside, but we would like to go ahead and get started. Uh, I'm Danny Fallon. I am the dean here at the Rollins School of Public Health. Importantly, my deanship is named the James W. Curran Dean of the Rollins School of Public Health, um, which is one of the smaller ways in which uh, Dean Curran has um, affected this school. And as those of you who have read this book, has really affected the health of us all. Um, and so it's my you know, just joy and privilege to uh, have the Rollins School hosting you all. Many of you are alums, many of you are uh, partners with us at the CDC or Georgia Department of Health or other places. Many of you are all of those things <laughs> intersecting, and we're so glad that you're here. I also want to welcome the folks that are listening online. Um, and I won't say much more other than to introduce our um, chair of the Department of Behavioral Sciences and Health, Behavioral um, Health Education Sciences, <laughs> BSHES. Um, we're so used to just saying that. Um, Mr., uh, Dr. Don Ferrario, who will then give an introduction and then um, lead into our panelists today. So welcome all. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Danny said, I'm Don Operario, and I'm just the chair of the BSHES department here at the Rollins School of Public Health. And I am so honored to be able to introduce these three distinguished scientists and to say a few words about their amazing book, which came out this year by Oxford University Press, Dispatches from the AIDS Pandemic, A Public Health Story. This really is a captivating story. It's equal parts science history, medical mystery, and reflective personal story, storytelling. The voices in this text remind us of the struggles and the breakthroughs in the early days of HIV AIDS. How an initially small, but then rapidly growing team of scientists built a knowledge base to characterize and intervene on a then known cluster of infections which led the way to the characterization of a global pandemic. We learn in reading this book how their efforts brought us to where we are now in the modern world of HIV prevention, treatment, and policy. The themes in this text provide a relevant lens for analyzing and interrogating what has been going on throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. These are also cautionary tales and lessons learned to apply to future pandemics and public health crises. From a personal perspective, these authors are heroes of mine. As an emerging public health and HIV researcher in the 1990s, I've been always aware of who they are, probably more healthy than you would find. Um, in fact, a colleague of Harold and mine, uh, Adrian Smith, uh, we happened to overlap at Oxford in the mid 2000s, um, Harold, uh, Adrian and I used to refer to them as the three Jedis, mythical figures who've been trailblazers and defenders and guardians. So maybe they're not Jedis per se, but they're definitely heroes to, the, to those of us in the world of HIV AIDS research. They are from my immediate left, Dr. Kevin DeCock, who was the founding director of the CDC's HIV AIDS research in Cote d'Ivoire, director of the CDC's division of HIV AIDS prevention and surveillance and epidemiology, and founding director of the CDC Center for Global Health. He's also been professor of medicine and international health at the LSHTM and, and the former director of HIV AIDS at the World Health Organization. To his left is, as we know, Dr. James Curran, who in 1981 was tapped to lead the newly formed task force on Kaposi's carcinoma and opportunistic infections. He then led multiple CDC programs in HIV AIDS throughout the 80s and 90s before joining Emory as Dean and Professor of Epidemiology at the Rollins School of Public Health and as Director of the Center for AIDS Research here at Emory. And to my far left, Dr. Harold Jaffe, who also in 1981 joined the initial task force on CAPC sarcoma and opportunistic infections. He then led numerous leadership positions across the agency's HIV AIDS program, 
including service as the director of the National Center for HIV, STD, and TB prevention, and later served as CDC's associate professor director for science. From 2004 to 2010, Dr. Jaffe was professor and head of the Department of Global Health at the University of Oxford, where we happen to work together, where he established the university's first MSc course in global health science. Please join me in welcoming these distinguished leaders, scientists, and my personal heroes. Uh, Dean Fallon, thank you so much for the very kind words, and Don, equally thank you for the very generous introduction. And to everybody here, good afternoon, and thank you so very much um, for coming. It's it's a real privilege to to be here to to do this uh, to present this book uh, at Emory. Um, and I, I personally, I'm so impressed by the extraordinary facilities that you have. And Jim uh, obviously played an important role in developing that, but really just wonderful to be here in this extraordinary setting. So it's a real privilege and, and uh, pleasure to introduce the book, Dispatches from the AIDS Pandemic, uh, a public health story. Uh, on behalf of my two co-authors, Drs. Jaffe and Karen, uh, thank you to Emery and to the School of Public Health for hosting this. And also to, to the folks here, Vanda Hudson, Michelle James, and others for, for putting this on. Um, I joined uh, CDC uh, in 1986, uh, five years after the beginning of the AIDS story, uh, as an epidemic intelligence service officer. Harold Jaffe and Jim Caron were my seniors, sometimes supervisors, uh, often my mentors. And I, I do want to emphasize, I'm the very junior partner in this trio. <laughs> so, uh, but all three of us are now retired from, from CDC. Um, three um, additional aspects uh, need mention. From 2015 to 2019, doctors Bess Miller and Mary Chamberlain, uh, former staff members at CDC who also had worked on AIDS, conducted some 52 interviews with CDC colleagues for an AIDS oral history project that is available on the Global Health Chronicles website that's managed jointly by CDC and Emory University. Mary is here. I don't know if Bess is here. I have, have I don't think I've seen her. Um, this was an uh, our book cites a number of these uh, interviews. Um, second, Robin Mosley, who was a, a former CDC writer editor, made important contributions editing the book. And finally, the striking cover image of the book, which depicts the AIDS ribbon and reminds us of uh, earlier forms of communication. <laughs> was designed by Grace Wilson, uh, who I don't think has arrived yet. She was coming. She is a medical illustrator, but she also to be, happens to be Harold Jaffe's granddaughter. <laughs> I recall saying to Jim, you know, probably 20 to 25 years ago, and as I, I think many others must have done, saying, you know, Jim, you really need to write a book. I, I later said the same to Harold, and in about 2020, we actually started writing, Oxford University Press agreed to the concept and the book appeared earlier in May of this year. And it describes events over the course of the AIDS epidemic through the eyes of CDC. And we do recognize that this is a limited window. And of course, many other organizations and people made enormous contributions that we don't consider. The book is divided into three sections, each with an introductory chapter. Part one deals with the early epidemic in the United States, part two with CDC's early international work, and part three brings the story up to date. And there's also a prologue and an epilogue. Dr. Jaffe will discuss the early epidemic, and I will discuss early international work and the modern era. We'll ask Dr. Curran to comment intermittently and to provide some conclusions before opening this up for questions and comments. So I pass the floor uh, to Harold. I'd like to add my thanks to the Rollins School for providing the kind opportunity to share our book with you. 
In discussing section one, which concerns CDC's work on the early domestic epidemic, I'll read some excerpts from the book to help illustrate the key events that occurred at the time. I want to thank Mary Hilpelshauser. I don't know whether I told her that I stole her slides, but I did. <laughs> The story begins with two reports from the MMWR dated June 5th and July 4th, 1981, describing young, previously healthy gay men from Los Angeles, San Francisco, and New York who had developed a rare opportunistic infection called pneumocystis pneumonia and an equally rare malignancy called Kaposi's sarcoma. The first cases of what we now call AIDS were reported by Michael Gottlieb immunologist at UCLA Medical Center, Twain Chandera, CDC Epidemic Service Officer, assigned to the Los Angeles County Health Department. Quoting from the book, Godley had seen three of these men with pneumocystis at UCLA Hospital and was aware of another patient at Cedars Mount Sinai Hospital in Los Angeles. As Chandera recalled, quote, Mike came down to my office and lo and behold, there was a fifth case report from St. John's Medical Center in Santa Monica on my desk that day. I never exactly been able to explain whether this was some sort of super unnatural serendipity or exactly what the cause was. Dolly and Chandera agreed to share a report on these five patients with MMWR. This was the days before fax or even email. And Chandera noted, quote, that he and Gottlieb had a call in word by word to CDC. The June 5th report shown here did not make the cover of the issue of MMWR and did not use the term homosexual men in the title of the decision made by the editor, Dr. Michael Gregg. Since the disease did not fit neatly into any pre-existing organizational unit at CDC, a multidisciplinary task force was formed was placed under the leadership of Jim Kern, who you might recognize here, looking just slightly different from he does today, still pondering questions of life. Quoting Jim about the task force, it was an eager group of people that came from out the agency, people working on cancer, people working on virology, people from STDs, people working on environmental issues, all were assigned together in this ad hoc task force that we call Kaposi sarcoma and opportunistic infections. We call it that because we wanted people to recognize this was not just an epidemic of cancer, not just an epidemic of infection, but an epidemic of a conglomeration of things forming a syndrome. Initially, cases were called into CDC by ind individual providers, but that quickly became impractical for a national surveillance system. So we therefore developed a surveillance case definition. The definition required that Kaposi sarcoma or pneumocystis be diagnosed by a reliable method. And we also included about a dozen other life-threatening opportunistic infections. Patients had to be under age 60 and have no known cause of underlying immunosuppression. <laughs> Cases meeting the case definition were reported through health departments to CDC. The epidemic curve drawn here comes from the pre-PowerPoint era. Any of you remember that? And was hand-drawn by Dr. Mary Chamberlain while working as an EIS officer for the New York City Health Department. Cases from New York are shown by the crosshatch bars. Cases from the rest of the US are shown by the open bars. Jim, do you have any comments about the case definition? Well, thanks, Harold. Uh, I guess, first of all, I'd like to also welcome uh, our colleagues here <clears throat> and acknowledge the many hundreds of years of contributions a lot of you have made to AIDS. Um, I know that because I know a lot of you old people in the audience and, uh, uh, and I know how much you've contributed over so many decades. So thanks for coming and also thanks for a lot of your work. Uh, well, you know, in retrospect, of course, surveillance is the conscience of public health or the guidepost of public health or however you look at it. 
and uh, having a good case definition was the important thing. And we lucked into it because we had something that was so specific. Each individual case was the first one any doctor had ever seen in his or her career. And so we knew if you fit the case definition, uh, then we were studying something that was new. Furthermore, these people were so sick that they were virtually always hospitalized. So that was a catchment area for a definition. And the key part to it was its specificity. If you fit the case definition, you had it. And ultimately it was caused age. So that could tell us, is it new? Is it increasing? Uh, where is it occurring? What are the groups that are getting it? And the case definition then in active and passive surveillance in hospitals led us to really understanding what was going on with the epidemic. So that was the most important thing I think about it. A top priority at the time for the task force was to establish risk factors for disease and came in. So in October 1981, a national case control study was begun. We enrolled most of the living patients reported with pneumocystis and or Kaposi's sarcoma in the United States. Case patients were matched with apparently healthy gay male controls living in the same cities and matched by age and race. The strongest risk factors we found related to sexual activity. But since sex was highly correlated with drug use in this population, we couldn't entirely rule out an environmental cause. The evidence for sexually transmitted disease was strengthened by the discovery of a cluster of 40 men linked by sexual contact in 10 North American cities. Cluster investigation began when Dr. David Auerbach, the EIS officer assigned to Los Angeles after Dr. Shandero left, had heard from his contacts in the gay community that some AIDS patients had been linked by sexual contact. Bill Darrow, a research sociologist, went to Los Angeles to help our back interview cases. Darrow recalled, first two of these men mentioned the same sex partner. Quote, there was this very handsome debonair flight attendant for Air Canada that I met, and oh God, he was such a nice guy. When the third patient named the same sex partner, I dropped my pencil, and our back almost fell off his chair. We looked at each other with mouths open and said, how could this be? Darrow continued his investigation in New York City and returned to Atlanta to present his findings. He recalled, my fondest memory after describing the study to an in-house audience, the CDC, came from the task force member, Bruce Ebbett. He said, I'm willing to bet a six-pack of beer with anyone we hear that we're dealing with a sexually transmitted agent. All I could think of was, it's Miller time. The loans of the patient in the center of the cluster is labeled with the letter O to indicate a case outside of the cities and states listed on the slide. The letter soon morphed into the number zero and the flight attendant became known as patient zero. Jim, given the results of the case control study and the cluster investigation, are you convinced that the disease was sexually transmitted? I feel the need to uh, uh, defend CDC as not being the one that linked patient zero's name that was Randy Schultz that did that. I don't know how he found out, but he's the one that linked it in a California Magazine article. Now, Harold and I and other, some other people in the task force had a clear STD bias. We were in the research branch, what was then called the Venereal Disease Control Division, which gave us a lot of credibility toward that bias, but not much credibility with blood banks and, and other kinds of communities. But I think we always thought that this was something that was sexually transmitted because we had a long experience in working with hepatitis B with gay men, with the hepatitis division, and in actually beginning to conduct hepatitis B vaccine trials. This was useful to us and very important for gaining trust to the gay community uh, during particularly the beginning of the Reagan administration, which had rather undescribed, rather un, un uh, their homophobia wasn't really hidden. <laughs> I must say. And so I think that um, that helped us a great deal. And our bias, of course, turned out to be true, but a lot of people didn't believe it or they didn't want to believe it. 
Uh, you know, even then, cases were only occurring in maybe 11 or 12 states. And uh, gay men thought, it's those crazy people in New York and California. It's got to be some kind of drug they're using that's associated with sex. It's got to be something else. It can't happen to us. And, I, you know, I've learned as I get older and, and have approached my own denial of various things uh, as uh, chronic diseases, that denial is a, is a way we try to live. But it gets in the way of, a, of an epidemiologic investigation for etiology. So but that was our bias. And I think that we thought that was going to be it. But it really took the hemophiliacs and the transfusion recipients to prove to the major part of the community that this was an infectious agent. Before we move on, I want to introduce my granddaughter, Grace Wilson, who is the range. We did the cover, which is the best part of the book. You only have to look at the cover to get the book. <clears throat> Over the next year, the epidemic expanded to include injection drug users who shared needles and drug-related paraphernalia, heterosexual partners of IDUs and bisexual men, Haitians and Haitian Americans. Studies from done in Haiti and the U.S. on Haitian populations were not entirely clear-cut, but suggested the disease was being transmitted heterosexually. Disease resembling AIDS in adults was also reported in infants and children who were largely born to IV drug using in Haitian parents. The first indication that an AIDS agent can be transmitted through blood and blood products came from reports in AIDS and hemophilia patients. These persons received clotting factor concentrates made from the blood of thousands of donors. Then in December 1981, we received a report about an infant in San Francisco. This infant developed an AIDS-like illness after receiving multiple transfusions at birth. Investigations found the infant received a unit of platelets from a donor who developed AIDS subsequently after the, invest after the donation and died of AIDS later on. Until the December report, the mainstream media paid little attention to AIDS, but that suddenly changed. I recall television crews from the three major U.S. networks lined up in the corridor outside my sub-basement CDC office, waiting to interview me about the baby. While I was glad they were there, I wondered where they'd been for the last 18 months. I think the answer relates to the perception that AIDS was held by most Americans at the time. As long as it was seen as a problem of marginalized groups such as gay men, drug users, and Haitian immigrants, it was easy to ignore. But anyone might need a blood transfusion and be at risk for the disease. The American public was suddenly thrown into a panic about rumors that AIDS could be transmitted through casual contact or even insect bites. Some persons with AIDS lost their jobs or even their housing. We responded with several studies. The first was done in collaboration with Dr. Jerry Friedland and colleagues at Montefiore Medical Center in New York City in the Bronx. Working with Martha Rogers from CDC, they found no evidence of transmission from AIDS patients to household members through routine contact. The second study was a community survey done in a small agricultural town of Belglade, Florida, which examined the association of HIV and insect bites. Recruiting participants was not easy. As recounted by the lead CDC investigator, Dr. Ken Castro, quote, this, think of this, you have a government official showing up at your door, inviting you to participate in a survey that's gonna ask you about your sexual practices, your drug use, and so on. Not something that most people would wanna do. Fortunately for us, in the sampling scheme, it turned out the mayor's household was part of the sample and the mayor publicly agreed to be interviewed and tested. I think this helped encourage others to participate in the study. We found no evidence of transmission through biting insects, including mosquitoes. In March, 1983, two months before the discovery of HIV by Francois Barre Sunoci and Luc Montagné at the Institute Pasteur in Paris, the U.S. Public Health Service issued its first AIDS prevention recommendations. 
Dr. Bill Feige, the director of CDC at the time of the early investigation said, quote, less than two years after the first cases have been reported, the MMWR was able to provide an article on prevention of AIDS that is so good you could still use it today. So this is work we should look down at, look back on and understand the power of epidemiology to define something even before science can define it. In May 1985, the first commercial HIV antibody test was used to screen donated blood. And in 1988, Surgeon General C. Edward Coop sent his landmark report, Understanding AIDS to All American Households. This report provided, provided clear and authoritative information on how the virus was and was not transmitted. And it still stands today as an effective model for health communication. Jim, you knew Surgeon General Coop. What was your impression of him and his role in this report? Thanks, Harold. His, his nickname was Chick Coop. But he was anything but a chick. Uh, he was a very well-known pediatric uh, transplant surgeon from University of Pennsylvania, uh, and was the head of pediatric surgery there. <clears throat> he was recruited, he was a Quaker, and he was recruited by allegedly Nancy Reagan uh, to come and be Surgeon General because he had written a book uh, in opposition to abortion. Um, and he came in and the public health service kind of cordoned him off in the corner so he wouldn't do much harm. Uh, the American Public Health Association condemned his appointment. And he wasn't even really opposed to smoking in the beginning. But he was really a smart guy. And he was very headstrong. And he was a good researcher. Uh, in addition, there was a young... Uh, immunologist, infectious disease doc named Tony Fauci, who uh, had become the AIDS lead for NIH in 1983. And his office overlooked Chick Coop's primary residence. And it turned out he was also Chick Coop's doctor. So he, among the other things Tony has been influential about, was the writing of this report. Um, Secretly, I suppose, it'll be in Tony's memoirs. Maybe even it'll look more important than it was, but it'll be in his memoirs. Um, so when the, when the report came out, we were all scared to death. What would this look like? But he became the hero, not only of AIDS researchers, but the hero of the left for taking on Reagan and Gary Bauer, the Domestic Policy Council, and all these other people who had gotten in our way. Uh, and the only thing was, he wasn't the hero of the Reagan administration, and he didn't get to be secretary of HHS, but he became a hero because he looked at the science, he looked at the truth, and he wasn't going to get shoved around by a bunch of elected politicians. And then all of a sudden, he opened up about smoking and a lot of other things he learned about and became, I think, a well-deserved hero until he died uh, at, about nine, at age 95. Thanks, Jim. Kevin, over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Harold. Actually, if I could make another comment. Uh, Harold, Jim, and I um, wrote a couple of papers, uh, reflections on 30 years of AIDS, and then reflections on 40 years of AIDS. Um, I should say, we, we intend to keep doing this every decade. <laughs> but I remember in the 30 years of AIDS, we made a comment, actually. That we, I reviewed all the MMWRs, and the story is actually amazingly represented sequentially in MMWR after MMWR. And it really was a very important, um, you know, publication in general. So as, um, as American epidemiologists struggled to understand AIDS in Haitians, in Europe, cases of AIDS were being seen in patients from Africa who had none of the typical risk factors. Three quarters of them were from the Democratic Republic of Congo, the former Zaire. And CDC led a study in Kinshasa in the fall of 1983. And with the results of another investigation in Rwanda by Belgian scientists, landmark papers 
uh, were published in the Lancet in July of 1984, describing an ongoing heterosexual AIDS epidemic in Central Africa. Um, uh, Joe McCormick was the uh, PI on that study from CDC. He was the head of special pathogens, viral hemorrhagic fevers, <clears throat> and the senior technologist, Sheila Mitchell. Sheila's here, actually. I don't know where you're sitting, Sheila, but uh, that was an incredibly important investigation, Sheila at the back. Um, Sheila did sort of, there was, no, there was no HIV test. The surrogate test was immune deficiency done by manual CD4 counting, incredibly laborious. But that was really a, a very important study because it showed there was clearly a public health crisis uh, evolving in Africa. Um, this led to CDC establishing Projet SIDA in association with the DRC government, NIH, and Belgium's Institute of Tropical Medicine. And over its seven years of work, uh, Projet SIDA produced about 150 publications, about 1,000 scientific presentations, and many of the, much of this work absolutely seminal to the field. An important collaborator was the Congolese physician Bila Kapita, who you see in this photograph at the front. Quoting from the book, Robin Ryder, who was the second director of Projet SIDA, describes Kapita, quote, this is a noble figure, on the same level, I would say, as Kofi Annan, just a presence. And when he speaks, charismatic, no one doubts him. He was really the godfather of the project, end quote. Ryder painted a stark image of Kinshasa's Mama Yema Hospital, recalling the hospital, uh, quote, not a house of cure, this was a house of death. And Kapita recounted how for several years the hospital had been seeing increasing cases of unexplained fatal wasting and of cryptococcal meningitis, end quotes. The first director of uh, Projet Sida was Jonathan Mann, and we devote a chapter to his life. After just two years in Kinshasa, Mann moved to Geneva in 1986 to head WHO's first AIDS program. And throughout this time, Jim Curran was his supervisor. Man's leadership at WHO was transformational in its emphasis on health and human rights and how it forged the long-term AIDS response, really, to this day. He was extraordinarily eloquent. And from the book describing man at international conferences, and I remember I have an image in my, my head of Robin Ryder saying this. So, quote, Robin Ryder, who would succeed man in Kinshasa, recalled how man sparkled at these meetings. There was intense interest from the media in all he said. A later quote, his talks at the international AIDS conferences would bring thousands of people, literally thousands of people, <clears throat> cheering and to, their, and, and to tears, Alan Greenberg later recalled, end quotes. There was a lot of skepticism about AIDS in, or its importance in these early days, including in Africa. Man succeeded in getting AIDS accepted as a global priority, but also as an issue of rights. From the book, quote, major attention was initially focused on stigma and discrimination, but a broader insight was realization of unequal vulnerability to HIV. He increasingly emphasized human dignity as core and solidarity a duty. Linking the individual with the many, he railed against silence isolation and exclusion, end quote. Man clashed uh, with the later WHO Director General Nakajima and abruptly resigned in March 1990, and he tragically died in a plane crash in 1998. Uh, Jim, could you give a brief comment on that initial study in 1983, how you were able to support it, the work at Projet Sida, and a, a comment on John Mann. Boy, would I really love to. Uh, one comment about the MMWR, first of all, when I first came to uh, <clears throat> Emory, I was asked to write a 15 year article for the MMWR. And I reviewed that there were 320 MMWRs in the first 15 years um, about AIDS and HIV. And they were doing a lot of things. Uh, a healthcare worker worked with under David Bell and his colleagues, but virtually everything. So it was very important as a publication and remains so. Um, the other thing about 1983, and, and uh, 
you know, I've been asked to talk about lessons all the time, mostly because I don't do anything else but talk about history, you know. Um, and in, in the lessons I took from CDC to, to academia is uh, two things. It's all about how important people are. Um, and it's also important how committed you are to getting something done with resources. So, um, and, and there's a certain competition within the government agencies. So the trip to uh, Zaire back, you know, when AIDS wasn't even named yet, or just barely named, and there was no virus discovered, no antibody, no tests, was led from CDC by Joe McCormick, who was a extremely well thought of and um, actually Kevin's first supervisor. Uh, and that, um, uh, in, in with hemorrhagic viruses, and he'd worked in in uh, in that area of the world for a long period of time. He was accompanied by Quinn, who's had a very distinguished career, and Peter Piot. Now, these people were not shrinking violets, uh, and they were more engaged with AIDS than Dr. McCormick was. But Dr. McCormick not only had connections, he had Sheila Mitchell. <laughs> uh, and Nothing would have happened without Sheila Mitchell because she was a crack laboratory technologist. And they would study these diseases and nobody knew what the hell they were. You know, it's the old people are just dying and we think they have what they think they have. But Sheila could on site do CD4, CD8 subsets, T cells, they used to be called. And those studies in that very short period of time while they were there outlined how important uh, AIDS was in Kinshasa and in Africa and led to Jonathan Mann's first key keynote address on AIDS in Africa at the first International AIDS Conference in 1985. But the key thing was Sheila Mitchell being there to be able to get these tests done. And that showed that CDC had some leadership in this, even though McCormick wasn't going to be doing it. So the next trip was to find a leader and to find some money. And we were very unfortunate to recruit Dr. Jonathan Mann, who was French speaking, a crack epidemiologist dealing with the plague in New Mexico, to go there with his family. And the only, the only, the only thing I said he had to do, that he'd never been an African in his life. And I said, you got to go there first before you commit to do this. He said, oh, no, I'll, everything will be fine. So he went there for a week and came back and said, oh, I really want to do this. So we recruited an unbelievable leader. I mean, uh, I said to this guy after three or four months he was there, I said, you know, you have to start publishing some papers. And he sent me eight manuscripts in the mail the next month. You know what I mean? <laughs> and so that... Uh, and, and the million dollars I could find put into this to begin with led us into being the leaders of the partnership because NIH could only find a couple hundred thousand and we had Jonathan Mann. So one of the lessons was, um, just like with, with Harold and, and Kevin, uh, you should never, you should always assume that some of the people that you're supposed to be supervising or under you have a lot more capacity than you do. And you should nurture that. And uh, that certainly was true for Dr. Jonathan Mann, who is a remarkable leader. One of the other things I did that was bad was he, after two years, he decided he was going to go to Geneva. He'd only been there two years. And of course, that was going to lead us a whole in what would have by that time had been the largest research project in Africa. And I said, you know, WHO is a wasteland. You're going to be terrible. They're only going to give you $500,000. And again, his boss felt that way. Well, as soon as he got there, his boss died. And the director of WHO said, okay, you know, we'll let you go. And it became the largest program in WHO uh, while he was the leader. And he, he really transformed how the world thought about AIDS. It'd be it was okay to say that it was a human rights problem. It was okay that there was an obligation to deal with the human rights problem. Uh, he didn't get along too well with the new director general, uh, Nakajima, and so he quit. And I was unfortunately staying at his house the day he quit. He came in to me and said, 
Well, by the way, I quit. And of course, he was a, an assignee from the U.S. government. And um, they immediately called the Secretary of Health and said, your guy just quit on us. Of course, he would have been fired in a year anyway by Nakajima. Um, so it put some pressure on, on the CDC and the U.S. government. But he was a very bold guy who I think was an incredible leader to a global pandemic until his unfortunate passing with his vaccine researcher wife, Mary Lou Clements, man, in 1998. Maybe more than you wanted. <laughs> Um, 1987. Uh, I attended a small meeting on AIDS in Africa organized by NIH before the third international conference that was held in Washington, D.C. Uh, from the book, quote, the Harvard group presented findings on their asymptomatic sex workers in Senegal, while a Swedish team from the Karolinska Institute described patients from Guinea-Bissau with AIDS. French researchers reported on their recently described West African virus, later called HIV-2. It was all very confusing. If a novel human retrovirus was circulating in West Africa, then its distribution, pathogenicity, and transmission would need investigation. We did not have specific diagnostics, and a new agent could threaten the global blood supply. I suggested to McCormick that we needed a projet SIDA in West Africa, end quote. Jim Curran approved taking this work forward, and this led to Projet Retrocy in Abidjan, Côte d'Ivoire, of which I was the first director, and which studied the epidemiology of HIV-2, the spectrum of HIV disease, and interventions including short-course zidovudine for the prevention of mother-to-child transmission and cotrimoxazole prophylaxis. I'm pleased to say, actually, an old colleague, Dr. Diallo, is here, who was... Uh, uh, one of our first recruits, uh, an important investigator at uh, Projet Retrocy. So HIV-2 clearly is an AIDS-causing virus. It's slower in progression than HIV-1, less transmissible throughout most of its natural history, which explains lack of an HIV-2 pandemic. In 1990, CDC established a third collaborative international site in Thailand. And the fourth chapter of this section deals with this experience and uh, I'm glad one of the first directors, Bruce, the first director, Bruce Weniger, is here somewhere. Um, um, and uh, th the chapter describes uh, participation in the VaxGen trial, the first HIV vaccine trial uh, that was conducted in really a very important epidemiology uh, on heterosexual HIV transmission on the explosive spread of HIV in people injecting drugs. Thailand's epidemic never became generalized. And HIV transmission today is especially prominent in men who have sex with men. So, Jim, this was all long before ART or PEPFAR. How do you look back on this international work? And how did you, in your position, balance your domestic responsibilities and then funding this, this uh, you know, somewhat outlier work overseas? So one of the problems with having... Uh all of these really good people working on a problem that look to you for things, things are resources, is that they prevent, they present very convincing arguments. You know, Joe McCormick, Kevin DeCock, Bruce Weninger can say, our problems are unique and our opportunities are unique that really understand HIV better. And the world needs to, this understanding now. It's not only because we want to control HIV in Cote d'Ivoire or, or, or Sub-Saharan Africa or in Thailand, but it's because the world needs to know this. It's, it's analogous to uh, no one's safe till everyone's safe. Uh, no one's knowledgeable until we know about what's going on in other countries. And they're very convincing people and they had the courage to do it. I mean, you know, think of yourselves, I could never do this. I mean, that's that's the benefit of other people. Getting dropped in Cote d'Ivoire, fortunately fluent in French, uh, and said, said, you know, there's competitors there too, the Institute Pasteur, and just say, we're going to set up a groundbreaking project 
in buildings that have yet to be constructed or modernized to house that uh, and just do it, you know, do it. Bring in some colleagues and do it. And that's Kevin DeCock. That's what he could do. And the same thing with Bruce Wedger, who, who worked in Thailand, at least. I mean, he had that advantage. And he had a brilliant Thai scientist wife, Tip. I hope she's doing well, Bruce. And he did it there. Uh, and it's because they're great people. And we just based the use domestic funds and said, we need to do this to solve our epidemic in the U.S. because the opportunity to learn is so much greater. And we got away with it. I'm not sure. We didn't ask, didn't ask uh, permission as much as we asked forgiveness to the extent we could. And we have Bill Fagey as a director of CDC who is open to these kinds of arguments. So the um, third and final section of the book brings the history up to date with chapters on the origins of HIV, scientific advances, CDC in the modern era, WHO, and some, as aspect, some aspects of CDC's work under PEPFAR. A quote from the book, extraordinary science has clarified the simian origins of what in 1981 presented as a mysterious new human syndrome, end quote. And there's detailed discussions of the why we are convinced that uh, of the chimpanzee and gorilla origins of different HIV-1 subtypes or clades and HIV-2's uh, sooty mangabe origin and the likely cross-species transmission many decades before uh, AIDS was recognized. The chapter on CDC includes discussion of changes in surveillance practice. Uh, again, quoting from the book, Apart from the name itself, which comes from another era and has admittedly a jarring overtone of government control, one would expect the generally dry topic of disease surveillance to arouse little political or community concern. With AIDS, this was not so, <laughs> end quote, and that's somewhat of an understatement. Contention surrounded changes in the AIDS case definition, including hate mail sent to Jim Curran. And the move to named HIV reporting after the advent of ART was enormously controversial. A chapter on WHO, um, a personal comment, quote, I grew to think that CDC and WHO were mirror images of each other, back to front opposites, where CDC was a technical organization whose work has political implications, while WHO was a political organization whose work had technical implications, end quote. Roles and relations between WHO and UNAIDS were not, and are not today, always clear. But I did, em I did want to emphasize Peter Piot's contributions uh, and quote from a, um, some comments I made at a co-sponsor reception. Quote, I highlighted three of his contributions in particular, the annual epidemiologic reports that became universally quoted and the basis for decision-making, his judgment of when to throw the weight of UNAIDS behind ART scale-up, particularly for battles about drug prices and use of generics, and his success in bringing HIV AIDS to the attention of the highest political levels globally." End quote. The chapter on PEPFAR reminds how dire it was in the early days. From the book, Barbara Marston in Kenya said, and Barb is here, she's trying to be anonymous, but I, uh, <laughs> you can explain why, Barb. <laughs> um, Quoting uh, from the book, funerals were the common activity. Most people went to a funeral every single weekend. The thriving business when I got to Kisumu was coffin making, end quote. PEPFAR obviously has evolved tremendously, remains the lifeline for millions of people with HIV and their care caregivers is now celebrating its 20th year. And we certainly have to hope that uh, issues of reauthorization will be uh, overcome. Our success paradoxically has made AIDS more normal, but the work is unfinished. From the book, quote, by drawing AIDS into the mainstream of infectious disease practice, science has robbed the disease of some of its mystique from the earliest years and certainly the widespread attention it received. AIDS nonetheless remains a pandemic, a leading scientific and social priority and a paradigm of a global health challenge, end quote. 
Jim, uh, would you like to comment uh, on some aspects in the epilogue and any other final thoughts you have? Well, I, I'll say a few things and then you and Harold can add to the epilogue. I think uh, the first thing to say is that um, it's hard to remember now for people that are old and people who are young, who've never been there, what it was like in the first 15 or so years. I mean, it took two to three years to find the cause of HIV, a couple more years to agree on the name of the virus. Um, but then it really took until 1995, 96, before there was any really good therapy. So for the first 14 years, having HIV was a death sentence. You know, it's kind of like getting a mammogram and being told there's no cure for what you have if you have cancer. Virtually everybody who was diagnosed with HIV and a positive antibody test was equivalent to that diagnosis would know that they had a fatal disease. And uh, 60,000 Americans were dying every year in the last few years. Uh, but it wasn't just 65,000 Americans. They were the focal group of gay men. 75% of those deaths or 80% were in gay men. So the prevalence and the um, outcomes in the gay community in the United States was like the general outcomes in the worst places in Africa. And there were funerals every week. There were coffins not being made, but coffins being sold every week. So it was a horrible pandemic for the first 15 years. And of course, now there's eight or I don't know how many CDC counts every dying every year, maybe 12,000 of, of whom about half of them die with HIV rather than from HIV, and perhaps with chronic diseases which are facilitated by the infection. But it seems like it's so controllable now that we forget about it. And we forget just about how bad it was. Um, those of us who go back uh, 25 years can remember the Lazarus effect with uh, so many people who were about to die. My, uh, Ron Valdeseri was uh, my last deputy when I was kicked upstairs to the office, to the director's office to run HIV at CDC. And uh, his secretary was a young guy named Dalton. Remember Dalton? And he was 26 year old uh, man. I, he's still alive. I shouldn't mention his name, I guess. But he, um, uh, came into our office during a staff meeting in 1994 and said, well, you know, I've had pneumocystis, big strapping, handsome guy, you know, about Paul Johnson's size and looks, um, came in and said, well, my, my, I, I sold my health insurance policy in a viatical settlement and got uh, $40,000 and I went out and bought myself a sob converter. And, uh, you know, I'm going to die anyway. What the hell? Um, then about six months later, uh, he came back in and said, my Emory neurologist said I have an infection in my brain. And he took my keys away. I can't drive anymore. Then over the last six months that I was there before I came to Emory, he got sicker and sicker. And his big frame got into a wheelchair. People at CDC were great to him in the sense that he was able to work uh, part-time and work. He wanted to keep working, uh, but he got thinner and thinner. He was down to about 140 pounds, six foot two frame. And then I left Emory, kind of lost him. Um, and about a, then, the, then the drugs came out. And a couple of years later, there was a going away party in some, some apartment. Uh, I can't remember where. And Ron Valdeseri was there and he said, I should come and, you know, because I knew a lot of the people. I got there and I was having a beer and I heard this uh, piano upstairs. It was a, a kind of a townhouse and they were, somebody was screaming out, New York, New York. And I went upstairs and there was Dalton with a pot belly, now about 240 pounds, pounding his bottle on the, on the piano top. And that's just one of the thousands and thousands of Lazarus stories that doctors caring for people had. And the last I heard, he's still running a 
gay community group at St. Bart's Church downtown. Um, so that that's how AIDS changed uh, in the United States. But it wasn't going to happen in Africa um, until really until people really got behind it until George Bush, who I didn't really vote for, um, came up with PEPFAR. And there's a lot of reasons why people say that happened. Um, it actually doesn't matter why, but he really added a huge U.S. commitment uh, to caring for people with AIDS. Uh, I was on a, a National Academy of Medicine panel, which demanded that generics be used and not just U.S. Uh, patented drugs. And the cost, of course, of uh, AIDS drugs went way, way down, which facilitated this. Uh, and now there are 20 million or so people, many, most of whom are in Sub-Saharan Africa, being treated for HIV. But this is at risk with the reauthorization of the PEPFAR funding. So go to your congressman and say, this shouldn't happen. Now, you know, it's easy for the US government to say, to take $4 billion or $5 billion out of Africa and say, the countries now are wealthy enough, they can do it. And to assume that those countries will have the same priority for HIV treatment because there's so many people dying with so many other things. So this needs to be put back together. Uh, the last thing I would say is that uh, AIDS is not over. There's no ending of the HIV epidemic. I, I, I actually wrote an editorial with Mike Merson about not saying that because uh, epidemiologically, it's hard to get rid of something which, which lasts for life, which can never be treated. And it's, uh, it's fanciful to think that you can totally eradicate or eliminate HIV without curative therapy and or a vaccine, maybe both. Uh, on the other hand, it was inspiring to Congress and others to get behind it, but it gave the misleading idea that AIDS was over, we're soon gonna be over because we promised it to be over. And uh, it was a, a false promise. And the epidemic is still alive. Uh, more than a half a million people in the world are dying every year. And Congress is getting ready to try to take away PEPFAR funds. So that can be increased to a million a year. Um, and, and what I'm saying, of course, isn't the truth, it's opinion. So we'll turn to Harold and Kevin for some more opinions. Harold. I don't have anything to add. <laughs> um, I think we could probably open it up for uh, questions and comments from the audience. Um, an obvious question that always comes up, and this is actually discussed in the epilogue of the book, is um, what are the lessons, the long-term lessons? And this was all being written as the monkeypox, mpox uh, outbreak was playing out. Uh, also a pandemic by the definition of pandemics, uh, and of course, uh, COVID-19. Um, and there are comments about leadership and science and communications and community uh, and youth, because really it's the younger generation that has to take all this forward and learn the lessons, and apply the lessons that these epidemics, whether we like it or not, have taught us. That's it. Any questions for our authors? Yes, sir. <clears throat> David Bell, semi-retired CDC, and I had the privilege of working on some of these problems. Uh, it was a um, great series of presentations. And um, th there was one aspect that I don't think came through as, as, as much as it could have. And I'm just wondering if you might comment on that was um, the pressures on CDC from both, well, all sides, but I'd say the left and the right. I mean, there were times when I felt uh, CDC was getting whipsawed uh, by criticism from both the left and the right, including from our traditional friends who 
you know, maybe could have been more understanding. And um, uh, the, I mean, there were people who who were so there were people who of the importance of holding fast to science to try and put one foot ahead of the other in this environment. There were people who didn't want studies to be done because they were afraid of what the results might show that might impact on their political agenda, which a lot of people were afraid. The gay people were afraid they'd be stigmatized. The people who got stirred up on the other side were afraid they might get this from, you know, somebody coughing on them. And the, just the, the, the dentist case, and the, I mean, just getting whipsawed. And I felt like it was your leadership who protected us um, and, and went and fought those battles. And I just, well, I'm, I'm, you know, could you comment a little bit about that? Dr. Curran, would you like to comment? Well, you, you were in the middle of that, uh, David, quite a bit. And, and Harold also was engaged in a, the investigation of the dentist with AIDS in Stewart, Florida. And the, and the person uh, who, you know, it, it was shown unequivocally through uh, epidemiologic investigations and, and, and comparing the genetic sequences of the dentist virus versus the patients, that this was a dentist to patient transmission. Boy, the number of people that didn't want to hear that. Uh, the orthopedic surgeons, the, you know, all the surgical people. And we were, uh, to make it worse, uh, uh, was it uh, that crazy guy from North Carolina, I guess, who uh, passed legislation that said, well, all the, you know, people doing invasive procedures have to be tested, and if they're positive, they have to be stopped from doing invasive procedures and tell their patients about that. And that was built into the CDC appropriation bill because of this thing. And so it was a it was a real fixed battle between that. And what you're saying about the right and the left, and some people always say that if you, you know, if you go, the important thing is working with the community and the communities that are more disenfranchised, no matter what it is. In general, most public health problems, the people with fewer resources and fewer political resources suffer the most. You know, um, and, and, and that was true for AIDS even more so because of the gay community, injecting drug users, uh, recent Haitian entrants. I mean, you start adding the people together, you think no political clout until they could get it themselves. And so if you're not, if you want to be on their side, you got to be careful you don't have a Stockholm syndrome. You know, basically say they're always right. And, you know, uh, the testing doesn't mean anything. We saw this with COVID, people saying the test doesn't mean anything. It's crap. Every infectious disease, the test always means something. You know, but people, for a variety of reasons, mostly the scarcity of tests said it didn't mean anything. You shouldn't be tricked to say the wrong thing. You should try to tell the truth. So getting tested for HIV was always important. And identifying infected people was always important, even though they didn't want to be tested. Now, it led to the Americans for Disabilities Act. That came because of HIV, because people then with HIV couldn't be discriminated against, lose their health insurance or their jobs simply because they had HIV. But they were being given a death sentence. And they were really afraid that because 75 or 80 percent of the people were positive, that the CDC would be would be collecting or the states would be collecting lists of gay people. And, you know, it was a different time in the gay community then. We didn't have Anderson Cooper and Don Lemon and Ellen DeGeneres and all this. I mean, nobody was openly gay anywhere. There were gay organizations on college campuses. I mean, it was very, very closeted time, except maybe in San Francisco and Manhattan and a few other places, a little bit in Atlanta. Um, so we were in the middle between a, a very, you know, uh, or re religious oriented political organization trying to cut domestic spending. Um, I'm sort of like the right wing of the Republican Party now that got Reagan elected versus our constituents in the gay community and other communities that needed our help. I mean, we, we identified recent Haitian entrants as having AIDS. That was very harmful to the Haitian community. But they weren't all gay men. They couldn't be fit into other groups. 
And that's what the that's what the truth said. So we had to say it. Two thirds of the cases in Florida were a recent Haitian entrance. Um, we had no choice to say that, but that really led to a lot of discrimination against a group already discriminated against. And and how we felt is I used to say that we did feel like the body of a bird getting beaten to death by the right and left wings. So there was a lot to that. But but that's that was our job to do this. And and that we didn't always do it right. We, we maybe we didn't admit all the mistakes we made, but that's the situation you're in if you're within government. I don't know if you want to say just that I was six foot five before the dental investigation. <laughs> the you know, in the domestic work I was involved in, the most controversial thing was obviously HIV surveillance. When AIDS surveillance was introduced, cases were reported by name, and actually the community pushed for surveillance. Um, but HIV surveillance, once you know, once the window of looking at the epidemic was closed because of the dramatic effect of ART, um, clearly going to HIV reporting was absolutely essential. And CDC felt that the data would only be uh, valid, really, if we if, if if the same reporting systems were used. But this was enormously controversial. The community had three concerns. One confidentiality because you know maybe an HIV report could lead to you losing your job or your, your your housing or whatever and you know being reported as an AIDS case when you're sick is one thing but if you're out and about and well that's a very different situation secondly that it would deter um, testing and uh, thirdly uh, the sort of inner feeling that I just don't want the government to have my name um, the way we address this, and I think this is relevant to COVID and to MPOX, um, and I, I think I see Athalia Christie at the back, actually, and this reminds me of the recognition of Ebola transmission from survivors, long-term survivors, many, many months, sometimes years after their Ebola infection. Um, the way to address, the way we address this, and Patricia Fleming was head of our surveillance group, John Ward previously, they, they looked at the science, and um, uh, Patty particularly led studies that systematically looked at the community concerns and were able to show that these concerns were, were actually not um, borne out uh, with named HIV reporting and that the, the data were much, much better. It's relevant to MPOX and COVID because um, I think looking back, um, in, in MPOX, certainly, I think initially there was great reticence to put the epi data out there. Clearly, you know, 95% or more of global cases outside of Africa uh, were in men who have sex with men. It was very clear. And yet there was a reticence because of concerns about stigma and so on um, to, to say it like it was. And I think that with time that evolved, but as Jim said, it's very important to tell the truth, even if even if we don't always like it. And the, in that Ebola case was the same. Interestingly, the experts were very reluctant to accept what you know we had shown in the field in Liberia was uh, was clearly going on. Um, and COVID, well, I won't go into COVID right now, but <laughs> um, there are some lessons there as well, and many 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 analogies. I was struck between these four infections, actually, including Ebola. How, what similarities some of, there are in some of the issues that were raised for infections that actually are very, very different and transmitted very differently. Kevin has a lot of energy. And uh, so another book is coming out <laughs> uh, that compares a lot of these things. Um, I, let me just say one thing about COVID. I'm chair of the Board of Public Health in Georgia. And... Uh, Many, many people have been forced out of their jobs or quit their jobs because of the disrespect and threats they've had when they're giving out vaccines or testing. And in the United States, lots and lots of health commissioners have been fired or quit their jobs because of the stresses uh, due to COVID. Uh, just like Tony Fauci has been disrespected, you know, we need people to be respected if we're going to trust them next week. And just because they don't know everything this week, as long as they're honest and transparent, we got to be on their side. So the CDC has been criticized for its, its work in COVID. And I wrote recently, 
you know, some of the criticism is justified for CDC's response. This was a public health crisis of the century. It was an emergency. Uh, and that criticism and, and scrutiny can be looked at. But what happens in government is criticism keeps going. Rand Paul has hearings on Tony Fauci to find out if he owns an Italian restaurant or something. And they cut CDC's budget. So reform of the CDC should be increasing the budget in ways that'll improve for the next step epidemic, not criticizing people and dumping them on a Republican Democrat situation and uh, in doing that. Because the people in public health need respect and they need nurturing uh, and leadership. Well, I think we're... Yeah. I also think we're fortunate not to have to do with social media at the time. It didn't exist. So we didn't have to deal with crazy rumors spreading over the internet in an instant. Uh, I wonder what it would have looked like if we had social media at the time. I think it would have been terrible. So in a strange way, we were lucky that that hadn't developed yet. Hey, Larry Kramer would have been Joe Rogan. I think we have one last question. Yes, sir. Hi, Jeff Lennox from Emory. You know, we draw parallels between COVID and the AIDS onset, but one thing that was very striking to me is that within weeks of the discovery of the SARS-CoV-2 variant, it was accepted as the cause of the pandemic. There was HIV denialism for well over a decade not just on the extreme fringes of society, but among scientists for well over a decade after the discovery of the virus. So I was always curious, what were the forces motivating those people to deny that HIV was the cause of the illness? And is this a one-off because it was a slow evolving disease or will we see it again in the future? Thank you. I, well, I do think that it's, it was a very different situation in that, you know, so a disease like COVID comes along, but we have, it's within a context of respiratory infections that are well understood, uh, a family of viruses, coronaviruses that are relatively well understood, previous examples, SARS, MERS. So it sort of made sense, even though it was new. Whereas HIV, I mean, uh, AIDS at the beginning, was a true mystery uh, all over the world. And uh, I think that that is a background that is important. I think retroviruses were much less understood then than they are today um, uh, and their disease causing potential. And one other thing I'd, I'd be interested to hear what my colleagues say, but I was always struck early on that there was, there was never a sort of formal one study examining is HIV the cause of AIDS. It's sort of, uh, I don't know if I'm right or not, but it's, I don't, you know, there wasn't a sort of definitive case control study. Say, I mean, there are lots of cohort studies over time and so on, but somehow there was no marshaled, in my retrospective opinion, marshaled effort to show that this is the definitive cause. It's sort of, sort of infiltrated into the scientific understanding and Literature. I don't know if that's I think a valid the comment. Transfusion cases pretty much nailed it. Yeah, yeah. Peter Duisberg was an AIDS skeptic. Sorry, Peter Duisberg was an AIDS skeptic. Yeah. Volunteered to be injected with HIV. Yeah. Unfortunately, no one took him up on his offer. Yeah, yeah. The transfusion cases certainly. Well, we wouldn't have here. There are lots of lots of different strands of evidence. But anyway, there's a comment. I mean, yeah, there's also the inter I mean, and the other thing that we did at CDC, much to the chagrin of Paul Johnson's successors, is we had studies going on with Yerkes in which we inoculated HIV into chimpanzees. And ultimately, I think a couple of the chimpanzees got AIDS, but it took a while, but they were all infected right away. Um, the, uh, the other thing is the intersection of politics and denial. You know, now we see this so much with COVID about the denial of the effectiveness of the vaccine. It's like nobody believes that we should get they should, they should get the COVID vaccine. And the uptake among uh, young people was very low with the last boosters, only 45% among people over 65. And I bet it would be less than that this time. Um, and it goes back to a lot of the political discussions about uh, they're not telling us about the harms to these vaccines. They're not, they're not emphasizing or making it very clear what's going on with myocarditis 
and the in the RNA vaccines. How can we trust these RNA vaccines that are so new? Part of it is denial, and part of it is politics, and part of it is people fueling the politics. You know, I'd rather listen to my pillow guy than I'd listen to Tony Fauci. You know, because I mean, after all, he makes pillows. You know, he must be good, right? Um, and they're comfortable, or he says they're comfortable. Um, and so, part of this is uh, was also going on with AIDS, and the, and the biggest, the biggest. Uh, the, the hundreds of thousands of people who suffered the mo most were in South Africa. And Tabo and Becky was the worst leader in the history of the world when it came to AIDS. I mean, Harvard estimated that as many as uh, half a million or more people died of AIDS because he refused to allow antiretrovirals. And he invited Duisburg and his buddies over there to conspire with him to say that poverty caused AIDS, not HIV. I remember I was in nineteen ninety. Six, I think, at uh, Mama Yemo, not Mama Yemo, um, Chris Hani Bagarath. Baraguanath. Huh? Baraguanath. Saraguan, yeah. The hospital in Soweto <laughs> um, in uh, Cape Town. And uh, the doctors there had AZT sitting at the bedside, and they were forbidden to use it by the government and Minister of Health, even though it would prevent. A transmission from the 30% of the women who they saw who were pregnant who had HIV. And just and it, it was killing these doctors that all they had to do was give this medicine and it would work. And they said, HIV, the government and the Minister of Health said, you're forbidden to use it. And you can sit there and watch this. And this is the worst example of, of political leadership uh, and also the worst example of the importance of denial if you accept it. But you got to say, why do you accept it? Why does a political leader reach the fringe for something like Trump did with hydroxychloroquine or like Scott Atlas did with whatever he did? There's got to be a reason politically that somebody goes to the fringe to look for science. And unfortunately, or fortunately, uh, our, our country, the president does have as much power as and Becky did at the time. Anyway. All right, well, thank you to all three of you. Um, really important to document this um, pathway through the epidemic. And it's just fascinating and powerful to hear your stories. Um, thank you all for being here. And the authors now will go out to this area for those who would like um, them to sign your book. So thank you all.